landscape architects in general is they know that the ultimate impact of your your design takes time because you're not going to get hundred year old trees uh, without waiting. You know, it takes it just takes time to mature, and so um, it's a long game for sure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. This week, I have my old buddy, Derek Hootmer, uh, who uh, we have an interesting story about how we met, which we'll we'll get to in a little bit. But to uh, start the episode out, Derek, do you mind just telling uh, the listeners who you are, where you're from, what you do, and just give us a quick overview? Yeah. uh, Well, first off, Tyler, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited about your your new adventure um, and I'm honored to be on here. So um, yeah, my name is Derek Hootmer. Uh, I'm a landscape architect and urban designer. I'm also a partner at Hoot Landscape Architecture based in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, tell us about Hoot. Yeah, Hoot is a uh, coming up on two years now, a landscape architecture practice in Kansas City. Um, that I started alongside with my dad, uh, who's also a landscape architect. Um, I will say most of it was probably in in my court to get it started. He is um, still employed and is is kind of a a good advisor for the practice. Uh, We've expanded and I've I've gained a partner, a good colleague of mine uh, has joined me from New York City uh, just last year. Uh, And so we're, we're kind of doing doing it all as much as we can, um, both work here in Kansas City in the region and um, also a little bit international. So, yeah. Cool. And to the folks at home that don't know what urban design is or art, landscape architecture, can you give like a top level uh, overview of what that is, what that means? Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, uh, landscape architects get kind of looped into the landscapers of, uh, of the world. Uh, they hear the word landscape and often kind of go to uh, trimming shrubs and, and mowing grass, but we're actually just architects of the outdoors. And uh, oftentimes you'll hear the words uh, urban designer thrown in because it's also just the designing of urban environments. Um, and as you can tell with the sirens, probably in the background that I'm in an urban environment myself. So um, anything from parks to plazas to streetscapes, um, everything you see outside the building that's kind of our domain. Um, yeah. So uh, for the listeners, uh, Derek has been in my phone as Subway Derek for almost a decade now because we were uh, we were both doing an internship uh, at uh, in New York City in 2012, and uh, he just kind of Derek just saw me uh, looking at a map, and he said. Hey, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> I was like, "No, are you?" He's like, "No, I just came here from Kansas, and uh, and I'm here for a semester of college." And I was like, "That's crazy, me too." And then, yeah, we just hit it off, and uh, here we are, ten years later. So, um, and I remember from those days, um, just walking around New York City, and you knew every plant, every tree, every shrub. Um, and then another thing that we made a point to do was kind of walk um, some some you know iconic savannah par- i mean savannah new york city parks like central park and the high line um so you know how did you get how did you get started in this i mean i know you said your your dad is doing it as well but like what really piqued your interest at the at the, at the beginning yeah it's a it's a good question um and you know listening to a little bit about your story um it's always interesting to look back at your childhood and figure out the constellation of why, why you're here. Like, and when you, when you find your passion, um, I'll say that as a kid, I, I constantly drew, I was always drawing. Um, I, whether it be, you know, it wasn't like an artistic standpoint, it was more of a nerdy kind of perspective. So I was designing kind of things as a kid, like my own game boys, my own houses, airplanes, whatever, whatever it was. Um, It it was just intriguing to me. Um, The other thing was I was a huge Batman nerd. I don't know if you recall that, but what (laughs) here? Exactly. Um, And, you know, even when I was two years old, I carved the the Batman symbol into my my parents' wood floors. Um, So it started really young. And I I don't know 
why, but I feel like that was a big part of it was I was just kind of always intrigued by the city and like this like mythical Gotham city. And so um, New York was kind of in the back of my mind. It's always this like destination. Um, and lastly, I think it's weird, but you know, my family's from Kansas, um, but we're a family of immigrants. My family immigrated here in the fifties um, from the Netherlands. And so that's kind of where I get my, my height and my, my looks, but it's kind of a blonde hair, blue eye type <laughs> Norwegian look, but um, it's, it's a big part of who I am. I think I was exposed to Dutch culture really early on and being able to go over as a, a young kid and, and see um, the Dutch side of things of, you know, being resourceful and, and very environmentally friendly um, kind of, it's just a very pragmatic country. And so I like to think a big part of that is just kind of my DNA of being able to create places for people to live uh, in urban environments. And so um, kind of while I was studying landscape architecture, I came across this like practitioner in New York City who dedicated his whole career designing these tiny urban spaces across New York City. And um, it was kind of the fundamental piece of his practice. And it, I don't know, something about that just triggered my passion and all of a sudden it all kind of coalesced into my interest for designing cities. So, and it was a long winded answer, but um, yeah, that's kind of where, where it all came from. So when you were graduating high school, you knew you wanted to, what, what did you study in college? First off? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I actually went to Kansas state university to study architecture, uh, having been exposed to landscape architecture my whole life, helping dad with projects it just didn't pique my interest. Um, a lot of the focus was some of it was residential work, um, single family homes, really great stuff. However, I was much more about people and, and, and places and just kind of creating social dynamics um, within those cities. And so when I discovered that I could kind of bring both of those together, that's uh, about halfway into my program at, at Kansas State, um, that's kind of where I, I fell into it. But uh, yeah, um, so I think all along through high school, I knew I wanted to be an architect, but I didn't know I wanted to, to do landscape architecture in this capacity. Uh, what are some hallmarks of like a good urban design? What? Some good examples, perhaps, maybe? Uh, um, yeah, some good examples, some particular features, or maybe some KPIs of how you know what you've envisioned is actually successful? Yeah. No, it's, um, well, I, I won't act like I know what KPI means. <laughs> uh, just like, just basically indicators. Like, how do you know okay. if, if what you've designed is a success? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think success can be defined in many ways. I think uh, environments that promote uh, equity and, you know, um, social dynamics such as being able to make everyone feel welcome, feel safe, uh, whether that be, you know, really great sidewalks, really great bike lanes, um, uh, space for performances, spaces for people to play, uh, people to interact, you know, places for those, those dynamics. I think when you, when you see environments that you've designed and they're using them, in the ways you imagined or in ways you didn't imagine, but at least they're inhabiting them um, and they're, it's enriching their lives. I think that's kind of the, the KPI, if you will. Um, and so, you know, good, good urban design examples exist when you're walking along a street and um, you've got the coffee shop on the corner, you've got the, the cafe tables on the sidewalks, you've got um, streets that invite people to, inhabit them you know they're not afraid to cross the street because they're gonna get blown away by a car but um you know maybe there's some uh enticing you know attractions across the street from a, a park perspective uh you've got great shade from the trees you know all these dynamics that come into play um i would say are, are really great indicators of just good urban space are the um, are the architects and and you know city planners and retailers um, overlooking uh, urban design and the, and the outdoor space or is it is it something that people think of at the last second or like oh yeah we probably should like throw some benches here or 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 is it just something that you know people 
know needs to be planned out uh, ahead of time. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned that. There's a whole kind of thing that started maybe 20, 30 years ago called new urbanism. And really, it's not new at all. It's, it's just old urbanism, which is just kind of returning to the fundamentals of city making. Um, so everything from the kind of spatial volume that you're in. And when I say spatial volume, I just mean you're in a park, you're in a plaza, you're in a street, and the building is kind of in creating an enclosure for you. Um, and, you know, the dynamics that are created from those buildings. So if you've got residential or office spaces above the second, third, fourth stories, you've got people looking down, watching people. There's a dynamic of safety there, but also visibility. Um, you've got activity on the ground floor. So you've got people coming in and out, um, interacting with each other, seeing each other from different walks of life. Um, and then you've just got the, you know, the ground plane, you know, like I said, um, just making sure that the ground plane is designed in a way that uh, promotes, um, again, just safe environments, uh, welcoming environments. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of in a roundabout way. Yeah. Explaining urban design. Are you, um, so who are you selling to? Are you like when you're, when who is going out to reach new clients, who are you, who's the first point of contact for you guys? Yeah. Um, a lot of our target clients right now, uh, differ between developers, uh, developers that are developing, you know, big buildings, um, multifamily housing projects, office towers, uh, public agencies. Uh, a lot of cities are looking right now at themselves, uh, specifically in the Midwest, and they're looking at their urban cores that have been kind of ripped apart by kind of more or less vehicular traffic or highways or surface parking lots and going, we, we could do more than this. We could do better. Um, and so those are the type of agencies we're looking at, like saying, well, we can, we can help shape those spaces. We can kind of help guide you to say, we think a, a building should go here, should face this way, and it should let in this kind of light and you could create this kind of open space um, with this kind of urban form. Um, it's, it's kind of like playing Legos on a, on a city scale, if you will. Um, that's kind of what we, what we enjoy. And then the last thing is architects. So architects are a big market. We, we work with them. A lot of times the building is the driver in terms of finances and economics. And so uh, being sub consultants to architects is a, usually a, a big part of it too, as we, we come in and, and be sub consultants to them. What are some um, cities that you've been to that are um, really inspirational? And what I'm wondering is, are you walking around taking mental notes or are you actually physically jotting down like, oh yeah, or maybe like you're dropping a pin on, on Google Maps or whatever. Like, how are you kind of organizing all the different things you're seeing out there? And yeah, yeah. no, it's, that's a good question. Um, and I apologize for all the, the New York tours I forced. It seems like all my friends get sucked into these like park tours. We were just doing it last weekend. Um, <laughs> so uh, in terms of organize, organizing these, these precedents, um, you know, taking lots of photos uh, when I can, you know, pulling out the notepad, sketching some details, just taking um, observations. Uh, th there's so much detail that goes into city design that we often just don't realize or we take for granted. And when it's working is when you probably don't realize it. When it's not working is when you when you see it. Um, and then, you know, obviously- In a BuzzFeed gallery. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we take all that information and, and, and try to throw it into our, our server, our digital library, and try to organize it in a way so we can recall those, those precedents in the future. Um, but things are always changing. Uh, the internet is probably a better documentation tool, but um, the really good projects really stick in your mind. Um, they, it's probably like any kind of movie you might see, or, you know, in your industry or some, some kind of film or documentary, you, you just remember it as a, a baseline. Um, but cities, you know, cities are great when you're, you're visiting them and you can kind of take in it with fresh eyes. You know, I, I want to see Savannah. I've heard great things. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I've been fortunate to live 
you know, New York, um, Seattle, uh, Portland, and Philadelphia now, and each of them had their own unique identity. Each of them had something to offer in terms of just creating good urban environments. But um, I tend to default to European models as well because they've been doing it a lot longer than us. And uh, so, yeah, um, there's there's information abundant everywhere, but it's uh, it's there's never a, a drain of inspiration. <laughs> so. It's kind of like when you're, um, you know, you mentioned you're renovating your condo right now. It's when you open up the wall and you see like, why would they, why would they, you know, put this wall here? And then, and what happens is like, people might have this idea a long time ago and then somebody else comes along and then they're like, a highway should go right here. And then right. like that just disrupts the whole <clears throat> flow of, you see these like dead end streets that don't connect. And then like, you got to go all, and I mean, if you're into that kind of thing and I'm not a landscape architect or an architect, but I'm a nerd. So, uh, you know, and, and I love geography. So I, I do know that like, Oh yeah, this is like old Louisville road and there's the other, and, and then this road, like it disrupted the whole thing. And now that's why I have to go 10 minutes out of my way because, you know, um, yeah. so uh, Savannah, yeah. Savannah was laid out in uh, 1733 by, um, uh, uh, an English general, and I'm like totally blanking on his name, but he's like the, a general, a general James Edward Oglethorpe, and uh, he actually had the plans for Savannah laid out before they knew where the city was going to go. He said, "This is where City Hall is going to go, and then it's going to be in this grid structure. In the center of each grid is going to mm -hmm. be a park, uh, a square, and then each in each square there's going to be uh, in, four administrative buildings, and then like twelve rows of." Uh, residential buildings and each of those things is going to be a unit and the idea is if somebody invades our city we can fall back into the next square down and and every residential place has like their own backyard in in the in the um form of a square so yeah. if you're into and we've stuck to that plan for almost 300 years and um and as we tear down what happens is you know we go through societally we go through periods of depression and then we're like you know what let's uh not do this plan and let's just put a parking garage right here and right. and that and that's what i was kind of talking about and then now when it comes time to tear down the parking garage we're restoring it back to the original oglethorpe plan that was laid forth you know in england before we he just found a hill and he's like this is a good spot for savannah and it's the uh, first city in georgia so You'd ha you have to come out um, just for that alone. So that's yeah. enough reason to to get out here. Well, and you can, you know, that's a great, I, I'm super interested now. And I, I've heard about the squares. I didn't know the whole history, but. Um, well, that's all, know, <laughs> I'm not a historian. <laughs> I'm just some guy, but, uh, but yeah, that's like the, my version of the, of Savannah's history. Oh, it makes absolute sense. Uh, Philly was, uh, Philadelphia was laid out in a similar manner, except um, the story was the parks, the squares were actually fire deterrents. So if the city ever caught fire, that's where the fire would initially stop or that was the concept anyways. But, um, no, it, it's, it's super interesting. And it, it's, it's even scarier when you see the East coast cities and that they had, a lot of them had plans before they were laid out. And then as you migrate West, the plans kind of dwindled or they were a less developed or they were developed around when the car was taking kind of the helm after the post world war II. Uh, it's just, you can see that across the entire country. And if you look at Savannah versus Los Angeles, you know, this, it's like totally different texture and feel when you're walking through the city. And so um, I think that's a, that's a bonus for East coast cities being kind of laid out before all that happened. So yeah. And you'll, and you'll, I've been, I mean, I mean, you look at the, you look at a Google maps of Boston and it's just like, they mushed, they mushed all these, what were originally carriage trails together. Yeah. And now there's cars and you're, you got to go a mile and it takes you an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, and, or look at lower Manhattan versus Midtown, you know, it's like they, and what I heard is that um, Central Park in New York city is modeled mm -hmm. after our Forsyth park, which is a, is a rectangular park in the center of our city. Um, yeah. And if you look at Manhattan and you look at Savannah, it's like Savannah is a much smaller Manhattan, which is pretty cool. And I don't know, again, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I heard. 
Uh, we'll take it. They'll yeah, claim we, it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I said it here first. So, uh, so um, I mean, I assume that um, with um, COVID, I mean, people are still trying to be outside. So, how has it really affected? How has the pandemic kind of affected uh, what you do? It's a good question. The, you know, honestly, the, it's funny. Everybody got closed inside. They they got sheltered inside. They were all of a sudden they discovered this like actual need to be outside. Um, we weren't getting it when we left home to go to the office and we were missing that kind of peace. And all of a sudden it's, it's almost increased the value of, of open space and public open space across the country. Right now people are realizing the importance of just being able to get outside um, and easily get outside. Um, you know, most recently in Kansas city, uh, the riverfront park here uh, saw an uptick of 400% in terms of usage this summer um, compared to previous years, just because of the sheer lack of, you know, open space, but also just people just needed to be outside. So I think, I think in terms of our industry, the, the trajectory looks really good. Um, people are demanding more of this kind of environment um, where people can actually step outside and enjoy it. Um, I would say that with that though, the, the financial piece of that is, has been more difficult. Um, public sectors have been really strapped. Every city's facing a deficit that I know of. Every city's faced a deficit. They're, you know, getting the federal funds, but that's, that part's been difficult because now they're just trying to keep the lights on, right? They're trying to keep people employed, trying to provide this, um, services. And so, um, what we've seen in the last 20 years is there's these partnerships that have been forming a lot of times where the private investment comes in and says, you know, we'll build you X for this benefit, or, you know, we'll build you a park if you give us this kind of tax break or whatever it may be, but these partnerships are, are forming. Um, and I think that's going to continue where a lot of the initial investment for public spaces and proving is going to come from the private sector and the public sector is just going to have to be flexible and all that. And all that. So um, I think the, the industry is, is good. And like I said, I think U S world report uh, states that I think two thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas by the year 2050 is what I recall. And so I, I think I've also read or heard that in order to keep up with the population growth and people, um, you know, migrating from climate change impacts or whatever it may be, um, we're going to have to build the equivalent of six to seven New York Manhattans every year across the, across the world. And so I, I think, I think our industry, as long as we're well positioned to say we're, we're designers of this, the, the public realm, um, I think we're going to be just fine um, in the long run. So, so if you were starting all over, uh, if you were eighteen, or um, you know, for somebody that's just coming up, w you would say that this is an industry that's going to be continually, continually growing, and it's something that if there is a program, whether they st uh, study architecture or some related field, that it it would be smart of them to get into this kind of field if they're interested in it. Yeah, I think I think what's happening now is um, urban design is kind of a broad topic. You know, it's not just isolated to landscape architects. Um, architects can do it. Urban planners can do it. Um, and I think where the struggle is happening is we're seeing as a profession, more and more people are more and more different industries are trying to capture that market. Um, and it's not a bad thing, you know, there's, there's a lot of space to be designed. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot more um, architecture firms and, and uh, urban planning firms kind of take on more public space design work. Um, I want to say that's bad. Um, it's just, it's just a, a reality so that the profession of landscape architecture just needs to kind of sink its teeth in more. Um, and it's just kind of a territorial thing. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it shouldn't have to be that way because all the professions have something to offer. Um, and so if I was, if I was 18, you know, I, I don't know if I'd ever I'd do anything different. 
Um, and I should clarify, you know, my, my program was it's a five year master's program. Um, it's a really great bang for your buck because um, you come in in high school you walk out five years, you've got a master's degree. Um, don't technically have the undergrad piece of paper. You just go straight into grad school. And after that first year, you have to decide, uh, do you want to be an interior designer? Do you want to be an architect? Do you want to be a landscape architect? Uh, and for me, landscape just resonated with me more. Um, and that was before I even knew the, the kind of sheer breadth of type of work that I could take on in that industry. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I would do anything different. I, I would say that if I could go back to college, I would have minored in other things, you know, business, um, maybe horticulture, you know, stuff that I kind of bypassed that I wish I would have milked it a little bit more. So. Um, tell us about the internship, how you found it, what it was, um, you know, was it beneficial, all of that? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> how, how old were you then anyway? Cause you're like, a, I think a year older than me, maybe. I think so. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, I was uh, 21 at the time. Uh, okay. New York, New York, I would say is my big first break, right? It was, I was my fourth year of college. Um, it was a required internship. Uh, frankly, the guy I work for, and you may remember this, but he was just kind of like a, he inspired me. His story of kind of growing up in a, a blue collar rural town in upstate New York, going to Syracuse and then moving to New York City and starting his own firm and just saying, I'm going to do something about this in, in the 1970s when New York wasn't really that great. Uh, Is this be, the guy you said you ins inspired you when you were younger, the same guy? Uh, this was the guy that inspired me about halfway through my program at Kansas State in college. Okay. And so you're like, I need to go work for him. Basically, yeah. Yeah. It was like, wow, this, this guy's story, he's doing really great stuff. Um, and it, it just resonated with me. And I was just so fortunate to get that internship uh, with him. Um, it was actually through an alumni network. Uh, it was just a couple of people. I was talking to a professor who sent me to another guy on the coast, and on the West Coast, who sent me to another alumni who had worked for him a couple of years prior. And he just, you know, he just opened the doors and said, well, I'll just send you, you know, over, I'll send your portfolio over to the firm and you can see if they're interested. And they were, um, I met the kind of one of the principals of the firm at a national conference in the fall before I arrived in New York. And, you know, looking back at my work, I wouldn't say I was worthy of getting that internship at all. I mean, it was, it's funny when you look back at the stuff you used to do and you're just like, God, this is garbage. <laughs> um, but he took a chance on me because I think he felt that I was really, I was serious about it. And um, being a kid from Kansas, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be there. I knew I, I didn't know what I was getting into, but he knew that I, I was serious about what they were doing. And so uh, they took a chance on me and that was my kind of my first big break. Um, and to the, to the point of where you came into the picture, I think I was probably three weeks into my internship. Um, no friends, no family, no fellow interns at the office. And, uh, you know, living in Astoria, Queens, it's just like, you're just a fish out of water. And uh, I, I would say I'm an observer of people, um, you know, observing how people act and use spaces is just natural. And of course, this is going to sound weird, but like I've, I'd seen you once or twice on the subway because it was like, what is this other, you know, tall, like gangly guy on the subway, like me getting on in Astoria. <laughs> like, oh, that's funny. I didn't know that. Yeah. It was just kind of like the good guy is clearly not from here. It, he looks almost out of place. And this is like no slant on you. It's just kind of like you kind of flock to, mm -hmm. to people that uh, look out of place. Just yeah. We like have you. very similar trajectories except <laughs> just completely different industries. Which is so exactly. Weird. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm not one to shy away from trying to, meet people and I was like well let's, let's let's roll the dice I think I was going to Times Square that night to like get some postcards for the family <laughs> and uh yeah you you also took a chance and 
invited me to hang out with it. Some of me. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, let's go to the bar. And you're like, uh, not really my thing, but all right, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I remember you either getting on the phone with the other interns at the Letterman show and going, yes, yeah, I got this guy in the subway coming with me. Like, what's, what's your name? Garrett? <laughs> like, no, Derek. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got <laughs> it was sheer panic on the other side of the line. I heard it and it was just like, Tyler, don't bring any strangers from the subway over. Um, but yeah, it was, it was great. I, mean, yeah, I, I met this guy on the subway. He's super cool. <laughs> he's coming, he's coming to your apartment. We'll be there in two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, well, I'm glad your, your friends didn't lock you out the night. Cause it was, it, it was really great just getting to know you, but also know, know all of them too. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. And you actually keep up with, um, you know, some of my childhood friends as well as some of the interns from Letterman. So it's just, and you know, you mentioned like your path to meeting, to getting, to landing that internship. It's like all about who, you know, building our network. I have a question for you. Yeah. After you got out of uh, college and you were doing your thing for a couple of years and you were moving around, uh, the country you mentioned living in a couple different cities you've now transitioned to being uh, an employee to being an entrepreneur so uh, what is you know what kind of uh, motivated that decision and what are some of the growing pains you've had since being a self-employed uh, urban designer yeah um gosh the, the challenges don't ever stop um, <laughs> as you probably know now um you know, uh, I, I will say that the biggest difference is just it's incredibly like freeing being on your own, uh, but also terrifying. Um, you know, that I would say the first six months of, of opening the office was just like constant uh, like weight on your chest when you wake up every morning, knowing that like nobody's going to be responsible except for you. Um, that was that was a big part. Um, and, you know, I think. I think the question was, what have I, what motivated me to jump into that? Um, I think, like I said, the, the guy in New York City's story always kind of inspired me, you know, just kind of um, just went for it. And I, I by no means took that big of a risk, um, but it was still a risk nonetheless to move to Kansas City. Um, I don't, I'm not from here. I don't have a huge market here. I just kind of jumped into a city that I, I have no real um, professional networks. Um, a lot of my peers at, at college have ended up working here. So I think that was something I relied on. Um, but it was also the opportunity of that I identified that Kansas City, I think, is kind of on the up and up along with a lot of other Midwest cities. Um, but I think, you know, a, a big transition was um, maybe you, you can feel this after working at, at Letterman is you know, just because you've worked in the big leagues, just because you've worked in the big companies or big firms doesn't really translate to you being a big leaguer, you know, in a way, um, you know, I've had a lot of marketing meetings where I, I talk about the people I've worked for, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm up to that level. It just means I've gotten the chance to work under these people. And so that's, that's one big takeaway. Um, obviously the net, the network's everything, uh, I would never have guessed some of the clients or connections that I, I've I had beforehand have translated to actual paying clients. Um, this is not at all what I anticipated. Um, and then the, I think, you know, a big part of leading up to the jump, I, I spent probably a good solid two years of just like planning and researching and going to small business development centers and, and trying to understand what I really needed to do. Um, and a big part of that was just being honest with yourself, looking in the mirror and saying, can, can you take the hits? Can you take the pressure and feeling of being only on your own and being scattered all the time and being pulled in different directions? Um, and, you know, honestly, I wouldn't do it any other way, but um, that was, that's some of the big things I've had to learn in the last couple of years. Um, did you want to, are you guys still considering a rebrand and, or did you want to touch on that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for your uh, feedback. Um, I'll do what I can. I won't dig too much into the rebrand other than the fact that um, the company name who was 
always kind of a placeholder in my mind. It was something about just kind of the idea of people getting their heads wrapped around that, um, I, you know, I'd be working with my dad. And so it was kind of the, the last name. It just kind of, it fit for the time. Um, but that was just kind of phase one. Um, I think there's a lot of potential uh, for professionals um, that want to push their careers, but be able to also live in the Midwest or be closer to home. And so the idea is hopefully we can rebrand to a company that would be more welcoming. That's not tied to one person, but more tied to a, a, an idea or something more abstract that people can feel ownership in, not just myself. Um, so it, it's ongoing, I will say, but it's that's kind of the ultimate goal and the, the end game. Yeah. Can you tell us about a project that you've done as as a part of Hoot that you're like particularly proud of or a, a, maybe a moment, a project, an element of a project, just something that you're really just like really proud of. Anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, some of my proudest projects, I will say, are ones that have kind of come about through pro bono efforts or efforts that really weren't actually there or, or, or projects that existed. Um, when I first started Hoot, um, we were approached by my hometown, Wichita, to uh, my former firm was approached to redesign the riverfront in the urban core, um, do a master plan, like 70 acres of the urban core in Wichita. And this is, I'm finding this out as I'm giving my two week notice <laughs> at my company. And the, the reason obviously was I had really good ties to the, the client in Wichita. They knew me, they really wanted to work with me and here I am like packing my bags. And so um, I was able to finagle a way to continue working on that project while starting my company here in Kansas City. And I, I acted as more of like a local liaison, um, just being here about three hours away. And so that was probably like one of the biggest projects um, in terms of just fulfilling, uh, being able to like do something in the city you're from in a very important position. It's right off the river, um, right in downtown. It's very controversial, but it's, it's, a, it's a, beyond that, it's just like one of those hallmark projects that I hope I can see come to fruition in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, so yeah. That, that's an interesting thing to think about I, that I didn't really consider. We talked about how you know cities evolve at, through time, but um, you're really actually, what you're working on is gonna, could, could outlast you, your lifetime, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, how do you plan for the future in that way? You know, honestly, um, really great projects just take a lot of time. They take a ton of time and it, it starts with a big idea and then it's got to go through public process and, and funding and construction. Um, and, you know, the average project, depending on the scale and politics and all the funding behind it, you know, it could take five years on average to realize. Um, and some of the, the investments, you know, we're, we're doing here in the city, nobody's asking us to do. Um, some of the projects we're just like, we're just gonna redesign this little space over here and see if it has any stick, you know, if it sticks with anybody. And um, that's also been really rewarding, but realizing that it's probably gonna take, you know, five to 10 years before it's really realized. And um, that also comes with, landscape architects in general is they know that the ultimate impact of your your design takes time because you're not going to get 100 year old trees uh, without waiting you know it takes it just takes time to mature and so um, it's a long game for sure um, there's not a lot of instant gratification <laughs> in the field um, for younger people or for people that are interested in learning more, what are some resources? Are there any like trade magazines or websites or social media accounts that they should follow? Where, where can you kind of point people? Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects has done a, a good job there. Our professional practice kind of organization, they've done a good job, I think, of creating a media campaign a few years ago of just saying, here's what a landscape architect does. Um, here's what we are. Um, here's where you can go to school for it. 
and uh, here's the type of work that you can do in the future um, and the impact you can have. So I would kind of steer people there because they can also point you to nearby programs. Um, it's a small profession though, um, for sure, but the, the resources are definitely out there now. And uh, are you open to people connecting with you? How can people find either you or your business online? Um, would you, uh, you know, would you want people to, uh, you know, follow Hoot on Instagram or go visit your website or how can they learn more? Yeah, this is the part of entrepreneurship that I'm like not a huge fan of self-promotion. Um, yeah, you can follow us on, on Instagram, uh, hoot.la, it's H-O-E-T dot L-A. Uh, you can also just go to our website, H-O-E-T dot L-A, and I'm always open to people reaching out, telling them about what we do, um, and just being straight with them. I don't, I don't uh, sugarcoat anything. I, I like to be honest with people and, and be real, um, so I'm, I'm more than welcome to help whoever's out there and spread the word. Awesome, man. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. And uh, yeah, you've always been, you know, from day one, we just like clicked. So it's cool that like almost 10 years later, we're still having this conversation. So yeah, no, it's uh, super lucky of, um, on my part to get to meet you <laughs> in New likewise. York. So, um, so do you have any closing words for our listeners? Yeah, I would just say, you know, um, it's really hard to do this, but your, your childhood passions really do kind of drive who you, who you can be. Um, and so just kind of following that all the way through and seeing if you can do something with that in the, in the professional realm. Um, yeah, I know skateboarding and videography was kind of your, your starting point. So I think that's, it's really key to how you turn out as a human. I, um, I was going to tell a story, but I try not to just talk too much because I do have that tendency that like the worst skate park design is when a construction company comes in and they're like, we know how to build a skate park. We put, you know, and then they just like shove as many pieces together. Whereas really like nowadays there's, there's actually, um, skate parks that are actually more designed like public plazas and public spaces yeah. to have that street feel that urban feel but are still like in a park setting yeah. so it's skateboarding's come a long way in that in that realm no too. i i still go back to that time where we were doing a skate park in the in the park in new york and i i still go back to the time you took me to the skate park and said well this is why it works this is why it doesn't work do this and this and it's all about the flow and you know seven or eight years later, I still remember all that. And I think that's what's great about this profession is there's no like limit to all the things you can learn about people and how they use space. So. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm going to close it out quick and then we could chat a little bit more. Um, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. If you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave us a good review. You can send suggestions for guests and episode feedback to we create uh, to wecreatetruth at gmail.com, or you can visit us online at creative-truth.com. Today I'm wearing a cool Creative Truth cap we've got mugs we've got all sorts of swag on the site so check it out thanks for listening and we will see you in the next episode